Well, thank you for that kind introduction. It really is a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I am so glad to be a part of this cyber business. You know, I brought my prepared remarks on an iPad, so this is a test for everyone who's out there to see whether anyone's interested in hacking into my iPad to see if I can successfully lose my remarks. Now, I purposefully brought some prepared remarks, and I'll try to zip through those reasonably quickly and then have the opportunity for you to ask any questions. You know, as I look out at the audience here, I've been to a lot of conferences in my life, and it really strikes me that I don't know that there's a more full spectrum of different types of faces and people from military to academia to industry to interested observers. And I find that that's why cyber is so important. Now, I do have a disclaimer here. If you look up here in the front, you'll see a group of uh, really young faces, a bunch of midshipmen from the United States Naval Academy. And so I was smart enough to bring my own fan club. So in case you ask some really tough or challenging questions, I'll just turn to them and they'll clap real loudly and smile. This, um, this business here for the U.S. and the Naval Academy, it, it strikes me that um, we've stood up a, an academic major in the area of cyber because we view this so important. But I'll tell you, I'm not here as a, as a U.S. Navy man. I'm actually here representing NATO's Allied Command Transformation. So I'm wearing a neat uniform, because I love it, but I'm here on behalf of NATO's Allied Command Transformation. And so I send greetings from General Jean-Paul Palomeros, who's my boss, and we at Allied Command Transformation are the only NATO headquarters in the, uh, in the United States. And so we have this really unique opportunity to work with the transatlantic bond across continental United States, but then we work just as closely with uh, the NATO headquarters and all that revolves around NATO. I hope you listen very carefully to both Admiral Rogers, who happens to be a close friend of mine, but we've agreed we'll talk about totally different things. But I hope you listen very carefully to Ambassador DeCaru as well, because he has a particular view about some of the challenges associated with what we have to do as an alliance. And so I'll talk about that in a little more detail, but his is sort of the on-hand, at-the-headquarters, day-to-day business. And then, of course, our work at Allied Command Transformation is trying to figure out ways to carry forward our efforts. Um, as I mentioned, ACT is uniquely positioned to take advantage of our relationship with the U.S. And frankly, everyone recognizes the U.S. has a sort of a principal role, but that doesn't mean that we own what NATO will do regarding cyber and the way ahead and all the challenges that are associated with it. But this opportunity to collaborate across the Atlantic, I think, is so important because, frankly, when all is said and done, what we do together as an alliance in this vital area will make all the difference in the world in where we go in the future. And so along the lines of collaboration, firstly, it would be a mistake not to mention the superb relationship that we share with Estonia. And it is a wonderful relationship indeed. As you know, Estonia has played a significant role in the improved capabilities of cyber and, of course, the relationship that we also have with the Center of Excellence. And ACT plays a big role in the accreditation of our Centers of Excellence. But frankly, the, uh, the team at the Center of Excellence has just marched forward uh, in trailblazing ways, and we're really happy about that relationship. And in fact, for the last three years, 
Estonia has been the home to NATO's and probably the world's largest annual cyber exercise, cyber coalition exercise. We'll be holding another one here in November. And frankly, it started kind of small. And next thing you know, this past year, we had over 30 nations, uh, countless organizations, again, across the full spectrum of probably each of your areas. And then we expect that it'll be even larger as we move forward in the future. So I would like to take the opportunity to discuss some facets of how we move forward and how we evolve. Uh, I have not served many jobs in NATO proper, and so one of the things that I found to be, and we'll just say intriguing, challenging, is how do you bridge the equities of 28 nations in a way that's collaborative and leads us forward? And the answer to that is it's a challenge, but it's not an insurmountable challenge. It's one that I think of all the areas we in NATO are committed to doing better, and I hope that we will continue to do that. I know we'll continue to do that because it's so important for the continued survival of our business. So while the internet and cyberspace have already provided many significant benefits, at the same time, I think, we all recognize that there are countless challenges. You know, it's interesting, I have a, a son who recently graduated from the Naval Academy and he is going into this cyber world. And so he's an information warfare specialist and so uh, fathers and sons have special relationships. And of course, my son says, you know, Dad, I love you, but you know you're a dinosaur. And so I say, thank you, son. I love you as well. But you know, you haven't seen this world yet. And there's a whole lot that I can share with you, separate from some of the technological challenges that I may have. And so when I look out at this audience and I see the large number of young faces, it strikes me as it strikes me with my son that where these young minds decide to go can make all the difference in the world of cyber. And so there is cyber for good, there's cyber for the strength of the alliance, and then there is cyber for other purposes. And so to the extent that we have the opportunity to influence these young thinkers along the way that can be helpful certainly to the alliance, then that's certainly one of my primary goals. And again, that's why I have this fan club here, so I can catch them and make sure that they, and it's not my job personally, but to catch and make sure that they continue along the paths that are most helpful for NATO and the Alliance. So, the access to advanced and sometimes damaging cyber capabilities by actors, both state and non-state, and that shifting balance of power is, uh, is really mind-boggling and eye-catching. You know, it's, it's interesting that small cells can have such great influence on cyber in ways that just a few years we thought were not achievable. And the fact that combined with a difficulty in attributing where some of these attacks may be coming from makes it an even bigger challenge. And frankly, it's a challenge that we, as single nations, as single entities, I suspect can't handle all on our own. And it really will take a continued collective effort. And not just military, not just the political military organization of NATO, but that with academia, and industry, frankly, industry has such a leading role as the ambassador mentioned, it's the collaboration with industry that will make such an important contribution as we go forward. So statistics certainly support that cyber attacks against the Alliance uh, continue to rise at an alarming rate. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with the recent report that 
Um, as it's described, cyber criminals have had a banner year in 2014, and of course that trend is continuing uh, this year as well. The scope of the threat landscape is much broader than any political military organization, again, such as NATO, can handle on its own. Now, I believe that regarding cyber and the way ahead, it's not all bad news, not all bad news by any stretch. Highly regarded reports have also stated that organizations that invest not just in technology, but in a holistic manner with sound risk management principles are able to achieve their security objectives and protect their systems. And so that's what we are really trying to accomplish with our collective efforts in NATO. Uh, this is a particular challenge, and we at ACT, and again, Allied Command Transformation is not doing this alone. We have a very close relationship with uh, headquarters and the folks at Emerging Security Challenges. But we work together to overcome the dependence just on technology uh, with a goal to maintain assured access to cyber, and that's vitally important. Uh, so what then are some of the greatest challenges for NATO from a cyber perspective? And again, as a NATO person, I love what it is we do together. I think we are stronger as an alliance, and I think the future is bright to the extent that we find areas to collaborate on. But what are those challenges? Well, I personally believe that the speed and pace of change in the world of cyber can sometimes be at odds with the slow and awfully often painfully deliberate decision-making process that we as an alliance of 28 can sometimes have, and that's a, to our detriment when we can't move swiftly enough on our feet. I also believe that too often our decision-making finds what I would call the least common denominator to which we can uh, agree or to compromise and sometimes that can often lead to inaction or, again, a slow action or response. I believe now more than ever that NATO at 28 must find a common approach to addressing our cyber challenges. And frankly, uh, I believe, in, whether as a military man or other, uh, unity of effort is fundamental. So ACT's approach... Our efforts has been to harmonize the varying aspects of cyber, and, and that is, I think, an important part because you have so many different facets. And, so, uh, and that was the title of my remarks today, was really how do we best cyber, harmonize cyber in NATO. When I think of this complex and challenging problem of cyberspace, I try to relate it to something that uh, I'm much more familiar with, and so I'll shift gears for just a second. So I am by trade, and as was mentioned in the introduction, I am by trade and by training a nuclear submarine officer. And I've spent a great part of my career in the undersea domain, and so I thought I would try to relate some of this cyber business to the undersea domain and certainly the submarine force because at least in our case uh, we've reached a pretty significant level of maturity in where we are. In the undersea context the need to assure watertight integrity of your systems is a matter of life and death. You simply cannot risk subjecting systems that have direct contact to sea pressure to anything less than the most rigorous and sophisticated engineering processes. But what happens when you have a leak or a breach and water makes it into the hull? Well, you have containment boundaries 
that can quickly be cut off to maintain the overall integrity of the submarine. The key, of course, is catching the breaches quickly. In recent reports, I saw that a breach had occurred which went undetected for well over 200 days. It takes little imagination to guess how a 200-day breach on a submarine might have affected it. I suspect the submarine wouldn't have lasted more than a day or so. But catching the breaches quickly uh, is critical to maintaining, again, in our case, watertight integrity. Knowing what areas are more critical than others and ensuring that they can be contained quickly and easily are essential to being able to continue operations. So in short, harmonizing all aspects of the submarine is vital to its survival. Ensuring you have the right technology, maintaining the right watertight integrity, ensuring you have processes in place and you're able to respond quickly. And then, of course, ensuring that the crew, and in this case we're all the crew, but ensuring the crew is trained and exercised to take advantage of the technology, the processes, the quickest ways to respond. If you don't train and exercise, you do not succeed. It's kind of a simple adage that we live by. So you may not know, but some years ago, the U.S. lost a submarine, uh, the submarine USS Thresher, more than 50 years ago. And so we learned some really stark lessons that I think apply. Now, speculation in this case was that the submarine loss was most likely due to a loss of integrity of a secondary or even a tertiary system as opposed to what we would consider a primary system. And this can certainly be the case with a cyber intrusion. Oftentimes the intrusions occur through the back door rather than through the front door. And your ability to figure that out quickly can make all the difference in the world to your survival. Now we can spend millions of euros in technology and have teams of cyber experts monitoring our systems, but with one bad click or one bad entry point, we could all be compromised. So for reasons such as this, the same rigor and intensity that went into developing submarine programs, I believe, are equally applicable uh, in the cyber world. But in this case, which is a little bit different, the cyber technology is changing so quickly, and so it's so much more important that we as NATO work collectively, have sound practices. Many of those things, again, that the ambassador described are the way ahead. And then we have to make sure we know what the weakest link might be so that we can adjust and adapt as quickly as possible. So what then specifically must the Alliance do to harmonize our, our efforts as best as we can? Certainly this is not an easy question. And so before I try to give a partial answer, just let me preface this answer with a simple notion. I personally am neither a proponent or opponent of offensive cyber. And nor do we at ACT have a particularly strong opinion about intelligence sharing as it applies to NATO's way ahead in cyber. And so I say that because those are two of the most challenging areas that if you're not careful, you can bog yourself down on the debate about uh, offensive cyber and you can bog yourself down on intelligence sharing and then not find those other areas which you can make progress on and do the right level of goodness for the sake of NATO and the Alliance. So we in NATO have much work to do, much that we can do collaboratively to enhance cyber capabilities irrespective of your particular positions on offensive cyber and intel sharing. 
So what are some of those things that we absolutely should do in order to harmonize ourselves better? Well, I believe we should develop stronger relations with nations and organizations that share our same values reg regarding an open and secure internet and its continued future development. We should continue to work to develop the policies as previously described and the doctrine that will allow NATO to operate together as an alliance of 28 nations or in some cases as a federation of nations supporting the execution of a particular mission. We should continue to develop and pursue a more robust training and education program that allows us to fight through any and all types of cyber threats in a unified and cohesive manner. And of course we should continue to develop greater interoperability and standardization in the cyber area and I think we can agree this is urgently needed. We should take necessary and incremental steps in assuring our ability to operate within the global commons that now includes both cyberspace and the related internet. ACT is working to ensure that NATO has the necessary cyber defense training to meet its requirements and frankly training and education is a really big part of what we do at ACT, what we participate in, but of course we're not doing it alone. It really is in collaboration with our friends in Estonia and the Center of Excellence. But from an exercise perspective, we're now integrating cyber defense into all of our military exercises. And this, of course, is occurring through the help of friends, allies, those here in the uh, European area and with the U.S. in particular. You know, there was a time when all we could do for training and exercise was to uh, flip a switch and turn off the internet and say, now deal with it. We're much farther advanced now and to the point where we're trying to inject signals, uh, false signals, trying to slow down processes. Um, and we need creative minds to help us work our way through developing scenarios that we can inject into our cyber exercises so that it's fulfilling, it's useful, and it's actually challenging. But that is the life that we lead, again, in collaboration with our friends here in Estonia. Now, just recently in the news, there was an example of how Romania is leading an effort to help Ukraine defend its networks and improve its cyber defenses. If we continue to take this same effort and get the very best from the many smart people and organizations that we can partner with and who can contribute to our improvement, then overall I think we'll be on a great path. I believe we have a real opportunity today to be more capable in cyber as a cohesive alliance if we choose to move forward again in those areas in which we can achieve consensus. We have seen the benefit of harmonizing and the great work that is going on in academia and industry as well. And so again, we can't do it without you. And so our collaboration with you will make all the difference in the world. We must not forget that NATO has been engaged in continuous transformation since it was founded in 1949. Since that time, it has adapted its policies, capabilities, and structures as required to deal with the current and future threats, including collective defense of our members. And so in conclusion, I'd just like to thank the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center for the invitation to be here. It's really been an honor to share some time with you. I look forward to this continued work. It's my honest opinion that there appears to be a wave of change that is building within the Alliance, and it's our collective responsibility to recognize this and continue to build 
on the progress that has been made today to date. If NATO is able to continue to harmonize and build consensus in the arena of cyber, it will in turn raise the level of cyber defense and cyber security among all its members. So thank you again for your time and attention, and I'm happy to field a couple of questions. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Admiral, for your, for your inspiring speech. And actually, we, we share this idea of harmonizing in cyberspace. This is actually one of the major objectives of SciCon, that we meet, that we share our ideas, that we learn from each other, and that we ask questions, of course. So the floor is open for questions. Thank you. Uh, Kuba Machak, University of Exeter. Thank you for your speech, sir. Uh, I have a question about ACT's uh, Global Commons Report 2010, uh, which was actually produced here in Tallinn. And in this report, uh, the area of cyber is, uh, is linked to the area of uh, nuclear deterrence. The report says that uh, while NATO has effective nuclear deterrent, uh, this, is, uh, this is a goal for the upcoming years. And the goal, if, if I remember correctly, the report says is to build a credible cyber defense capability. Sir, could you evaluate five years later whether this goal has been achieved and perhaps elaborate on that a little bit? Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great question. So um, I will avoid the urge to discuss cyber and nuclear deterrence in the same sentence. But to the question of have we reached our goal, for deterrence as it relates to cyber, the answer is not fully, but I think we're on the path. I mean, it, it starts with us finding areas on which we can agree to pursue. You know, as described, we now have uh, mechanisms in place. We have the, the cyber response organization that I think quickly responds to challenges within the alliance and we're certainly working to have stronger coherence and bonds with our approach to cyber from a strictly if you read the news and you see that there are still some attacks against NATO alliance members then you can at least say we haven't deterred them all yet but I think our efforts to work together as an alliance and to strengthen our cyber defense is really key to being strong in deterring cyber attacks okay. please uh, thank you sir um, I'd like to come back to the thresher. Um, as you said this was probably called by a failure of some secondary peripheral system so that leads me to the observation that the key problem we have with the internet today is the insecurity of the end devices, in particular rather old PCs which are not always updated. Uh, the newer stuff is somewhat better. But that, doesn't that argue in the sense of uh, forcing greater security on the end devices, which could be done in various ways, either through subsidies or through required levels of security, because most users are not willing to pay for it. I'm, I'm the case myself. I could use PGP encryption for my email, but I don't. And how many of you do? And why don't you? Well, because unless you're professionally involved in this, it's a little bit too difficult and too expensive. So shouldn't we at least be encouraging this or even requiring it? Thank you, sir. I think that's a wonderful thought. I, I certainly agree, and I think we all agree, that there are some systems in products, you name it, that are much more vulnerable than others. Um, I haven't been a NATO person all my life, but I can say this for sure, the chances of us getting consensus by forcing a requirement down anyone's throat, um, the chances of that are pretty small because that's how we are in NATO. I mean, there is uh, national autonomy that has to be respected. But I do think as people 
buy products that they find to be most useful, and, and I could certainly ask the young people. The other viewpoint is you develop the thing that is most user-friendly and most secure, and I can guarantee there will be a market to buy that thing. And so that's where this collaboration with industry, I think, makes all the difference in the world, because I believe there is a secure device out there or in the making, and at some point it's going to be at a reasonable price, and then we will all jump on to that bandwagon. But what's a challenge is finding a solution that's a little bit better than others and trying to force that on people, and generally speaking, folks generally just don't accept that. I see I'm just about out of time. I'm happy to take one more question, and then um, and I'll have to step off the stage. Hi there. I'm Steve Ranger. I'm a reporter with Tech Republic. Um, obviously, last year, NATO added uh, cyber as um, a, a, an Article 5, um, uh, particularly that, you know, an attack on uh, using cyber could be an attack on everyone. I'm just wondering what's your assessment of how that's, uh, that's worked in terms of uh, focusing people's minds on cyber and potential effect it might have had on some uh, potential aggressors? Uh, that, that's a great question. Did everyone hear the question? It's sort of the, the Article 5, how does that apply in the cyber world, and then where do we go from there? And so a Ambassador mentioned it. It's, it's really an important concept. The challenge, of course, is how do you apply it? And so I will just say you can rest assured that we, the Alliance, are committed to collective defense for all of our members. We would not prescribe a, a solution based on any particular theoretical uh, incident, but we certainly recognize that we have a uh, a political process that will consider whatever the threat or attack might have been and then we'll go forward. But the underlying principle and a big part of why NATO has been so successful and why the alliance has been so successful for 66 years is that the world recognizes we are serious about collective defense of all of our members irrespective of what that threat may be, cyber or other. Yep, Great. thank you again, Admiral. And uh, for you as well, we have the MAC, uh, Estonian Handcraft, nice. as a souvenir, not only from the conference, but also from Estonia. Thanks thank again. Thank you very much.